This conference will now be recorded. Thank you so much, Amelia. And I want to welcome everybody uh, to this evening's uh, talk. I've been looking forward to this for quite some time, so I hope everyone is uh, ready for a great night and a great presentation. Um, before we get started, I do want to uh, make sure that people are aware of some other programs that are coming up at the Mercer County Library System. Uh, next Wednesday on November 10th at 7 o'clock, we will be having the program uh, What's Next for Human Space Travel, and you can register for that on our events page um, at mcl.org, and it'll be a go-to meeting event just like this one this evening. And then on Tuesday, November 30th at 7 o'clock, again, it's another virtual program. Uh, we're having the History of the New Jersey Gay Men's Chorus, and that'll be a panel discussion of with a uh, a, a few of the members kind of talking about the rich 30 year history of the chorus. And again, you can look for those programs on our events page at mcl.org, or I encourage you to download our app, which was just released this year, My MCLSNJ, and you can find that in your app store on your devices. And while November is Native American Heritage Month, uh, tonight's program is not a standalone educational opportunity. MCLS strives to offer programming throughout the year for our community that is inclusive of diverse histories, cultures, and heritage. November is a time especially to celebrate Native American heritage, but recognizing and expanding our knowledge about those who shaped the land well before, well before the explorers and colonists is not exclusive to this month alone. So I hope tonight is a stepping stone for you um, to, take the, to take the opportunity to expand your knowledge of all of our histories. I'm very excited for our speaker this evening, um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce him so we can get started. Uh, we will be doing a Q&A at the end of the program, but please feel free if there's a question that comes up while the program is going on, please feel free to enter it into the chat box, and I will get to that question at the end of uh, Dr. Norwood's presentation, and he will field them at that time. So tonight we have Dr. J.R. Norwood, Jr. He is a tribal historian who served as the principal justice of the tribal Supreme Court and councilman at large for the Nanticoke Lenni Lenape Nation in South Jersey. And so without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to you, Dr. Norwood. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you for uh, hosting this event. I also want to uh, uh, thank Amelia and Laura for their services. Uh, Laura first contacted me, and, and Amelia is making sure everything goes well tonight. I thank you both for, uh, all three of you, for, for making this possible. I want to greet everyone uh, and, and welcome you to uh, this event. I'm honored to be able to present to you about the history of in the indigenous people here in New Jersey. I'm going to share my screen at this time so that everybody can see the presentation. No, oh, that's not what I want to share. When I welcome everyone to uh, the indigenous land, the name that uh, the ancestors referred to New Jersey as is Sheikti. And it refers to the fact that it is by the water's edge, not only does it, is it bordering the, the coast of the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, but we have the bay to the south and the river to the west. And Sheikbi is the indigenous name that uh, it, it is, is referring to the land that the people to even today live upon, a land that we still view as our traditional homeland, our traditional territory. One of the questions that I'm often asked when uh, I make presentations is how do your people want to be referred to? Are you a group, community, tribe, nation, band? And all of the words that I just listed uh, are, are acceptable. Uh, some are more accurate than others. The one that is not acceptable is group. A group is an organization of people that come together for various purposes, whereas our people that have lived in community for hundreds, even thousands of years, uh, we're a tribe. And many prefer the term nation, but uh, and community certainly is, is appropriate. 
but we're more than, than a group. Another question is, do you prefer to be called American Indians, Native Americans, Indigenous or First Nations people? And while uh, all of the terms have been used throughout history, actually that's a very individual thing. You'll find people who are tribal people, Indigenous tribal people here in, the, in North America who have a problem with the term American Indian because it was inaccurate uh, from the very beginning. Uh, we're, we're not um, in, in Asia and, and we're not in India, uh, so the term was always a misnomer. However, it is still used at the national level and quite commonly by many uh, who identify simply because that is the term that's used in many of our treaties. And to change it, given the history that we've had in the United States, uh, it has been something that we've been very concerned about. So many of the national organizations, such as the National Congress of American Indians, or the National Museum of the American Indian from the Smithsonian Institute, maintain that name for that very reason. I don't have a problem personally with any of the terms, but the most accurate way to refer to uh, an indigenous person is by their tribal name, uh, what tribe they actually are a part of. And most will not be offended if you ask how they want to be referred to and what their tribal affiliation may be. Another uh, point of uh, offense often is when the time prior to the arrival of Europeans is referred to as prehistoric. It is as though history does not begin until Europeans set foot on this continent. That is very offensive for us, and we prefer the term pre-contact by and large. Pre-contact simply means prior to that arrival, but it does not seem to suggest that history began at that arrival. The photograph that you see up at the top and the photos at the bottom are of many of the uh, representatives of the various tribes that continue here in New Jersey. Uh, and they represent the tribes that I'll be presenting on a bit in, in a few moments. One of the things that I always try to remind people is that it's extremely important to remember that not all American Indian people, not all tribal people are the same. Uh, we have a lot of common values, many common practices, uh, but there are also a lot of varying perspectives. And a lot of our rituals and practices and dress and cultures are very different. Uh, and it changes by region, by tribe, and sometimes even within tribes, by clan and family. One of the things that you can always uh, have a red flag pop up in your mind is when someone says, all American Indians believe or all American Indians think this way or that way. Uh, our people are just as varied as any people around the world. Some common practices, however, among North American Indian tribes is smudging, and that's the use of various natural medicines, cedar sage and sweetgrass. Uh, it's burned and the smoke itself is viewed as a type of medicine representing our prayers going up to the creator. Uh, representing purity, purging an area. It's used similar to the way incense is used in many religious settings. Uh, it is a natural incense. The pipe is also very common across many of the nations in North America. And while it's often called a peace pipe, it actually more accurately is referred to as a prayer pipe. Uh, the reason that it became associated with uh, peace is because such pipes would often be brought out when peace treaties were being cut. But the pipe itself represents prayer and ceremony. And those pipes were used in communal settings uh, for, for various purposes, including the making of peace treaties. The sweat lodge is also quite common, although the type of lodge and the ceremony held within will vary from tribe to tribe, region to region, and sometimes even from family to family. And the different tribes approach the lodge differently. But if you've ever been in a sauna, you can get a taste of what a sweat lodge is like, at least in regard to temperature. Uh, the sweat lodge is like a sauna on steroids. It's used for ceremonial purposes, spiritual, religious purposes, and also for medicinal purposes, for hygiene. Some other common practices is, are, include drumming. And although the types of drums and the types of songs vary by region and tribe, uh, the use of the drum is very common across North America. 
The small drum that you see up in the in the upper left hand corner was very common here in this area of the Northeast, and it is a water drum. It's a small drum that uh, the the immigrants referred to as a tom tom because of the sound that it would make, and it was a hollowed out log that had water in it at various levels to change the tone, and it would have a a skin stretched across it. And this type of drum is still used today, although it one of the adaptations was the use of kettles that were used in trade with some of the colonists. And even today, water, many people use the water drum uh, by stringing uh, a, a skin over a kettle and filling it with water. Those were used both for ceremony and for uh, social dancing. And that continues even today among many tribal people. Uh, the large drum where you see all the men sitting around two of them, that's a war drum, sometimes called a powwow drum, and it is used for social dancing and for ceremony. It's used at the powwows. That drum came to the east from the west. It is a drum that's far more common out on the western plains, but uh, we have always had cultures that shared various aspects here in North America, and this is one of them. The smaller drum, the hand drum that's uh, off to itself is it pretty much used everywhere. You'll find hand drums being used uh, in, in just about every tribe here in North America. Medicine bags are those small pouches that hold items of sacred significance for the wearer. And sometimes they're filled with traditional medicines. Sometimes they're filled with things that are significant uh, to that individual, a memory that they want to always uh, have near them something that they might pray over or might encourage their prayers. Uh, the eagle is considered to be a significant bird. Its feathers are considered to be sacred, although the various tribes also have other birds that they consider sacred, some even perhaps more sacred than the eagle. But most North American tribes do have reverence for the eagle because of the, the height at which it soars, its behaviors that it makes for life, fiercely loyal to family. The observance of the four directions is very common, although the way it is observed varies from tribe to tribe, region to region. And the medicine wheel itself, while it has been uh, adopted by many tribes, is actually not something that is, that is indigenous to this part of the country, although it has been embraced by many, many tribes as that tradition came to this part of the country. But the observance of the directions is traditional. Honor gifts are very traditional, and that is a token of esteem and respect that is given, and it can be a blanket, a feather, or even something as simple, I've seen fruit given as an honor gift, an acknowledgement of esteem for other people. Another thing that is common among America's North American Indians is the relationship that we have with the land, and the concept that the land is actually something that belongs to the creator and is given to the people um, to care for and to use, to be trustees, stewards over. And various tribes were given various areas of the continent to use, to hunt on, to farm. Uh, North America is commonly referred to as Turtle Island, and that relates to one of the very popular understandings among many of the tribes that the land itself is alive. One of the uh, stories that is uh, part of the tradition of the Nanticoke and Lenape people is that the continent actually rides on the back of a great turtle uh, that came up from the sea and some of the uh, mud from the bottom of the earth was placed on it and it grew. And that is what we live on today. The lesson behind that is how important it is to acknowledge the sacred nation, nature of the land and the fact that the land itself has spiritual significance and is living in some sense. The little creature you see uh, in the lower right-hand corner is a muskrat. And it figures prominently in the uh, ancient uh, lore of, of my people, the Natico-Guadape people, as an honorable creature uh, because it was the bravery and tenacity of the muskrat when other animals could not make it down to the bottom of the ocean to bring up the mud, the muskrat uh, risked its life to be able to do so. And that reminds us how important it is to have respect even for the least 
of the creatures, those that are small and would be viewed by many as insignificant, uh, have a great purpose within the plan of the Creator. Our relationship with all of the creatures is that we understand that all life is sacred and it all belongs to the Creator. We're connected to these creatures and we're not meant to dominate or overhunt them or simply see them as uh, resources to be exploited. There was a, a balance that had to be maintained between the forest creatures and the needs of the people. And that's part of the reason that hunters would pray when they took an animal. They would uh, offer up tobacco over the animal, literally apologize for having to take its life and thank both the creator and the animal for the fact that the sacrifice was made for the sustenance of the people. Every part of the animal that could be used was used in order to honor and respect the fact that the animal was alive and that sacrifice was made to sustain. In this region of the country, the largest uh, tribe in Sheikbe here in New Jersey uh, has been the Lenape people, the original people, the homeland of the Lenape called Lenape Hoking is, is an area that includes all of New Jersey, but reaches up into Southwest Connecticut southeastern New York, eastern Pennsylvania, and even northern Delaware. Uh, the Lenny Lenape are known even today as the grandfathers or ancient ones. I was at a conference years ago and met a gentleman who was old enough to be my father. And when he saw my name tag, he saw that the Lenape name was part of the tribal name. He referred to me as one of the ancient ones. Because even though he was a chief from the Great Lakes region, he acknowledged that our our people were the ancestors of his people. The Natick folk are, are the Tidewater people and their original homeland is across the central region of the Delmarva Peninsula. And like many of the tribes that are uh, Algonquian speaking nations, they originated from the Lenape. And then in the, uh, after the colonial era, during the colonial era, uh, the Nat many Natick folk uh, once again, merged with the Lenape, which is part of the reason that my tribe has that dual name. We're the individuals that stayed behind. Our family stayed behind and are a combination of the Nanakoke and Lenape peoples. The Lenape of West Jersey, which is part of the state that, uh, that Mercer County is in and, and most of Southern New Jersey, West Jersey was a separate colony from East Jersey at one point. Um, but the Lenape of West Jersey had a relationship with the Quakers. And while it's famous to, uh, uh, the, the fame of that relationship emphasizes uh, William Penn and the Penn Treaty that occurred in 1682-83 uh, over in Philadelphia at a place called Shaka Maxim, the meeting place of our chiefs. The fact of the matter is that he had a relationship with John, John Fenwick and the colony further south in New Jersey, which is where my tribe is located. And that relationship actually has been maintained and continues even today with the Quakers of South Jersey. The Sacramaxon Treaty is far more famous, however, and it is uh, the one in which our chief Tamanen represented the Lenape tribes and because our, our, tri our communities were a loose band of tribal communities that would come together, coalesce for for particular reasons, for negotiation, diplomatic reasons, ceremonial reasons, and for war. We never fought among ourselves, but we identified ourselves one with another and would mobilize whenever necessary. Uh, at Shackamaxon, which is today also called Penn Treaty Park in Philadelphia, there was a great meeting in 1682 that's been memorialized as the, the Great Treaty of Amity. There's a lot of artwork that, uh, that depicts that that treaty where William Penn's intention was to try to live at peace with the Lenape people, even though it was with his understanding that we would live in peace under the British crown. Uh, and our hope was indeed that peace would last as long as the creeks and rivers run and while the sun, moon, and stars endure. The early result, the early issues that came up after very early contact uh, prior to the arrival of Penn and, and even um, during that time period is that Anacoke and Lenape people had a hostile engagement with the very early settlers. Uh, when John Smith of, um, of the Jamestown colony thing 
arrived in our area across the Chesapeake Bay, he got a hostile reception because some of our people had been captured and taken by individuals within the great ships that would come up into the bay and come down the rivers in the Nanticoke homeland. 90% of our population was decimated within the first 100 years by disease and hostile conflict. Uh, one of our chiefs is recorded as saying that for every one of the colonists that got off the great boats, nine of our people would die. Another major uh, issue that continues to impact our people even today is the doctrine of discovery. Now, the doctrine of discovery traces its history back to some papal bulls in the 13th century and the 15th century, and it was to grant lands to Christian monarchs uh, and any, any of the lands that a Christian monarch claimed that was the land of what was referred to as an infidel, a non-Christian, uh, could be claimed by that Christian monarch. And this was um, something that was established uh, by the, the Pope uh, back at that time. And its initial target, its initial purpose was related to the Crusades, but with the, um, the colonization of the Americas, the, the doctrine or the principle wound up being practiced here uh, on, on this side of the planet also. And Pope Nicholas V is, uh, is recorded as saying that, that the doctrine allowed Christian monarchs to capture, vanquish, and subdue the Saracens, pagans, and other enemies of Christ, to put them into perpetual slavery and to take all their possessions and property. And that oriented and kind of dictated the way the progress of colonization happened here in the Americas. Even those uh, nations that were not Roman Catholic uh, still had the attitude that they could claim land. Uh, one of the unique things about William Penn was that he actually tried to purchase land from the Indians that were going to be claimed in this, in this area, even though he had already given land grants before successfully making arrangements uh, to share the land. One of the great misnomers is that from our perspective, the land couldn't actually be sold. And that when we gave land grants, according to our understanding of land tenure, it was to be shared. We were allowing people to share our land and to use it and to reaffirm that relationship on an annual basis. Uh, that was not the way that the Europeans understood uh, the, the uh, way that they were coming and claiming the land. And that's why you have this misunderstanding about our people giving away Manhattan for some beads and a few trinkets. It's because we never thought we were selling it to begin with. The understanding was that that was an offering to have relationship, to be allowed to share the land with us. We're also some of the first victims of biological warfare. Uh, the there are those who have suggested that this was never the intent, never the design of the colonial powers, but we have evidence that in many cases it was. Back in 1763, we have a letter uh, from one of the commanders of the British forces in North America that encourages the use of smallpox infected blankets to be distributed among our people who were highly susceptible to many of the diseases, especially smallpox, that was responsible for wiping out large swaths of our population. It was said that in many instances, uh, the elderly uh, and the, the young were the first to die. And there were many villages where there were not enough people left alive to bury. Another issue that occurred was that uh, the, there was hunting of American Indians for profit, which many believe is the source of the name Redskin. I, I'm just going to ask, uh, please, if someone has their mic open, if you could mute your mic. Thank you. Uh, the name Redskin uh, is, is derived from this practice of taking the scalp or some part of the body as evidence of killing uh, one of the indigenous people in, in the area and then getting a bounty for that sale. Now, the <clears throat> scalps of hostile Indians were worth 50 pounds, uh, according to the Maryland General Assembly, which controlled the Nanticoke homeland uh, at the time. And this was back in 1763. 
that bounty could be paid for any Indian that was deemed an enemy. And what's interesting is that previous laws dating back to the 1600s identified an enemy or hostile Indian as any Indian that was on an English person's land that didn't call aloud within 300 paces or that did not, if, if, if um, was met in the woods, did not immediately throw down any of his hunting implements or weapons and make a sign of surrender. Uh, and if anyone simply claimed that that wasn't done, they could receive a bounty, no matter whether that was the scalp of a male, a woman, or a child. Some of the political expediency, for political expediency, some of the things that occurred to our people is that even within the founding documents of our country, we see that we are referred to in the Declaration of Independence as merciless Indian savages, even though there were tribes that aligned themselves with the fledgling colonies that were trying and striving for independence, that just about all of the colonies here in the East could credit local tribes for their initial ability to survive. Uh, There's so many stories of, of the very early colonies uh, about to die out. And if it was not for uh, the local tribes showing them how to survive, helping them along the way, they would have died out. And yet the, uh, this is what is, is uh, forever memorialized in the Declaration of Independence that is read even to this very day on July 4th without any explanation or disclaimer over this term. The doctrine of discovery is not something that only is in the distant past, but it became a part of American law. There are three pivotal Supreme Court decisions in the 1800s that continued to further uh, relegate the ability of American Indians to maintain control over their lands, over their people, to be dealt with as independent nations that continue to, to hack away at, uh, tribal sovereignty and inherent rights. So much so that when the Declaration of Independence was signed and the Bill of Rights was signed, so many people celebrate that as the beginnings of, of freedom and dignity, but for American Indians, it wasn't until 1879 that American Indians were even considered persons within the meaning of the law. This is after the Civil War. It wasn't until 1924 that American Indians who were living on reservations, federal lands, could be considered citizens of the United States. And it wasn't until 1978 with the American Indian Religious Freedom Act that many of the spiritual practices could continue, even though to this very day, not all tribal people have that right. This isn't just something that is in the distant past. As recent as 2000, recently as 2005, the doctrine of discovery was cited in a Supreme Court decision that uh, uh, curtailed the rights of the Oneida Nation of New York. And it was none other than Justice Ginsburg, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who cited the doctrine of discovery in writing for the majority. Some of the ancient reservations that existed here in the United States are here in the East. Many people, when you think of American Indian reservations, you think about way out in the Midwest or the Great Plains, but the earliest reservations were right here on the East Coast. Uh, New Jersey had a, an official state reservation called the Brotherton Reservation, and there were also many unofficial reservations called Indian towns or Indian fields that dotted the landscape. Some of the reservations to the north of us in, in uh, New York and up in New England and to the south of us continue even to this very day. And our people, both here in New Jersey and in Delaware, the Manico people in, in, and the Lenape people in Delaware and the Lenape people here in New Jersey were forced uh, onto these reservations at a very early time. Although 
if they left, the reservation would be claimed vacant, even though it was the traditional way for our people to migrate seasonally. And what we have depicted on this map is the forced migration of the vast majority of Lenape and Natico people out of the region, many uh, going as far west as Oklahoma, where they uh, two of the tribes remain even today, up into Wisconsin and even up into Canada. And those of us who stayed, uh, who were called the keepers of the land, um, and my own uh, ancestors who were referred to as the Bay Indians, wound up being reclassified as free persons of color, mulatto instead of Indian. And part of that was to eradicate the Indian presence in this part of the country. In 1740, there was a law that, an in, that defined an Indian as a non-Christian living in the woods, eating primarily deer meat. And it was modified in 1770 to say that it was only those living far away from the state of Delaware. So that if you lived in Delaware, you were a Manticoke or an Ape person, and you were eating primarily chicken and living in a uh, European style house, you were no longer legally considered an Indian as far as the government was concerned. One of the moves that took place in the 1880s and continued straight into the 1960s was to take Indian children and put them in boarding schools and to remove them from their families, often forcibly, in order to assimilate them. Those little uh, handcuffs that you see are obviously the size, for the size of a child's wrist, and they actually are part of the museum at a boarding school that some of my own relatives attended, Haskell, out in Kansas. The tombstones are from the uh, a boarding school uh, up in Pennsylvania, where there were many Indian children that were taken, and it was one of the model boarding schools that was established under the principle that was used for prisoners of war during the Civil War. It destroyed American Indian families, caused trauma that continues in many of the families today, sought to undermine and destroy the culture of American Indian children and to take away language. Now, people ask, are there Indian tribes in New Jersey? And the fact is, yeah, absolutely. And most Indians don't live on reservations. According to the 2010 census, 78% of people who identify as American Indian or Alaskan Native aren't on reservations. And there were about 70,000 people of American Indian descent in New Jersey that registered as such. And there are three state recognized tribes in New Jersey, making up about 6,000 enrolled tribal citizens and many more that are not on the rolls, but are indeed part of the tribal extended family. In the region, you have quite a few different American Indian tribes in the north, the Ramapo, the Nape Nation, um, the Sand Hill Indians, the Powhatan Renape, who are uh, um, Virginia Indians that moved up into the region, Sand Hill are Cherokee Indians that moved up into the, into the region, both intermarrying with Lenape families that remained. Then you have the Bay Indians that are all related, the Nanticoke, Lenny Lenape, the Lenape Indian tribe of Delaware, and the Nanticoke Indian tribe. All of these tribes are state recognized with the exception of the Sand Hill Indians, but they are recognized by the state recognized tribes. The Nanako Lenny Olape are the original people of the Delaware Bay region that have remained in the area from ancient times. Our tribal ancestors are the ones that were living on reservations and in designated Indian towns and can trace our family lines back to those locations. We've been identified on muster rolls during the French and Indian War, the Revolutionary War, the Siemens Papers, the Civil War and Census records as Indian people. The government records and news articles and anthropological studies done from the 1800s continue to identify our people and our family names and where we lived uh, in community, uh, even from that time period. And some of our family members were forced into attending Indian boarding schools. Our communities continued in tribal churches and three tribal churches continue to exist to this very day and are acknowledged by uh, their states as historic Indian churches and by the United Methodist Church, each of these churches is United Methodist, as historic Indian churches. They were established by tribal people um, and they served as the seat of tribal governments uh, for 150 years. And the one at the bottom 
there is actually the one in New Jersey. It's in St. John's United Methodist Church in Fordville, New Jersey, which is a little community in Bridgeton in Cumberland County. And that congregation served as the seat of the tribal government until the later, latter 60s, early 70s, where demographic shifts uh, caused the tribal people to reorganize outside of the church with a constitutionally organized uh, elected council and elected chief. But for so many generations, the leadership of the church was the leadership of the tribe. And this is a common story up and down the East Coast of tribes of first contact. We've can maintain community. Our churches served as uh, schools for our people, meeting places for our people. And to this very day, we continue to advocate for our people. Our culture is alive and well. While we maintain many of the old traditions and have new ones, uh, it, is, it is something that, that is continuing to evolve. American Indian culture is not stuck in the past. We maintain, maintain some of our old ways, but certainly many modern ways are incorporated into how we do things to this very day. We continue to honor our elders and the traditions that they have passed down to us, and we strive to strengthen our youth. Uh, the principle is that we honor the seven generations before us, and whenever we make decisions, we are mindful of the legacy we leave for the next seven generations. The relationship that our tribe has with the nation of Sweden is an interesting one. New Sweden was established in the uh, lower Delaware Valley in New Jersey and Delaware, and uh, that was a colony from the early 1600s. Uh, and we have maintained a relationship with the nation of Sweden all that time. Our uh, tribe, tribal children actually opened the Swedish embassy in Washington, DC, the, the, what was the new embassy about 10 or 12 years ago. And the uh, king and queen of Sweden have regularly held audience with our chiefs. Uh, you see the, the chief, uh, Chief Mark Gould shaking the hand of the King of Sweden when uh, there was an official royal visit into our territory, and they honor and respect that old relationship. Some of the things that I think are important to always correct about uh, misunderstandings that need to be corrected about our people is that we were never TP people. Those of us here in New Jersey and in Delaware lived in villages that had wigwams and longhouses. Uh, this early depiction of one of our villages uh, comes from New Sweden. And as you can see, there's not a TP there. Uh, we used dugout canoes in this area, not the bark canoes that were used a little further north of us. Never were devil worshippers. Matter of fact, our people have always been monotheistic. We believe in one creator. And as you saw earlier, many of our people, but among those that stayed here, stayed behind, as so many were forced further west, were Christianized, which was one of the reasons that many of us were able to stay and not be pushed out. We were never savages or uncivilized, and we were not nomadic. We simply moved between a summer and winter village. Usually the winter villages were in the interior of, of the area near a river, and the summer villages were by the coast. So that old tradition has been maintained here in New Jersey through many, many centuries. Uh, we were the one, some of the first to be placed on reservations here in the East. And another thing is that we're not reenactors. There's a lot of, lot of people that, that want American Indians to uh, behave like a reenactor, to, to, to dramatize some historic situation. But when we put on our regalia, we're expressing who we are today, not necessarily just who we were years and years ago. American Indians don't receive government checks. Any money that we, that comes to the tribe is uh, because the tribe serves in the place of the state. And there are many services that a tribe provides instead of the state or in addition to certain state services. And so uh, tribes may distribute funds that they raise because of their industry, but uh, the federal government just doesn't cut you a check simply because you're an American Indian. If anybody figures out how that happens, let me know, because I'd like to get one, but I've never seen that happen. Most American Indians don't live on reservations. Most live in houses and have jobs just like everyone else. We're citizens of the United States and of our tribes, 
And interestingly enough, one of the things that we've had to constantly remind the government here in New Jersey, not all tribes want casinos, and our tribes here in New Jersey have even have a compact indicating we'll never pursue them. Our traditional dress is called regalia and not costumes. A costume is what you put on to portray something you're not. Regalia is something you wear to portray who you actually are. And our culture is not stuck in the past. It's important that people understand exactly what an American Indian tribe is. And the claim of being a band or a tribe or a nation requires some, some historic criteria that it's an interrelated historic community of families that have lived in community and maintained tribal governance for at least a couple of hundred years, at least going back to the 1800s or earlier. If that's not the case, then while it may be a historic, uh, a, a history appreciation group or cultural enthusiast group or society, it's not a tribe. And there are no new tribes that are formed. These are communities that have existed for generations. Some of the points of frustration that our people have is that we have those who are self-proclaimed experts that disregard the historic communities and our own testimony about our own history. There's a misappropriation of ritual and culture that takes place. There's an apartheid-like system in the federal Indian policy that perpetuates this colonization that we have and actually divides our people. And a big issue that many people have been dealing with here in New Jersey is the issue of sports mascots that demean and degrade us. There are those who assume that such mascots are honoring us, but actually not only the National Congress of American Indians and the Alliance of Colonial Era Tribes, but even the American Psychological Association have all come out to condemn uh, cultural appropriation and the use of American Indian mascots as being harmful not only to American Indian people, but also to non native children. There is a uniqueness in indigenousness. Unlike any other racial group in the United States, non-indigenous groups have a cultural heritage that exists somewhere else in a foreign land. And if they can, they merge here in the United States and become part of the so-called melting pot, their culture continues to exist elsewhere. That's not the case for American Indian cultures. Indigenous cultures, if they are suppressed, which was indeed the program of the United States for many years, that culture becomes totally extinct on the planet and all humanity is lessened because of it. For non-Indigenous groups, whatever you say you are, you're accepted as. Not so for Indigenous people. We have to prove who we are and have to be connected to some tribe and then that tribe has to be acknowledged in some way by some outside authority. If you're not indigenous, you have a choice in whether you're going to be part of the melting pot or not, with the exception of those who are the victims of American slavery. But the American program, the US actually has had a policy to destroy American Indian culture and to assimilate, to either destroy the tribes completely or to, and or to assimilate those that they could not destroy. American Indians under the law cannot even label their arts and crafts as American Indian made, even if they are made by uh, folks who's, who, for whom that craft has been passed down through ger generations, unless they are members of federally recognized or state recognized tribes. And there are hefty penalties and fines leveled against those who violate the policy. And there are some people who fall between the lines on that. I, had the opportunity, my wife and I had the opportunity to uh, sit with a chief from one of the Western states who was grieving over the fact that his own grandson, who was descended from several different tribes and was fully immersed in his culture, did not did not have enough blood quantum, which is one of the ways that some tribes measure whether you can join or not, from any one of the tribes that he could qualify to be a citizen. And therefore, his crafts could not be labeled American Indian made if no, none, of, none of those tribes claimed him as American Indian. That's nothing that, that is traditional among our people. That's been a, imposed upon us. And sadly, so many have kind of drunk the Kool-Aid on that. I think it's the right way to think about identity. 
there is a link between tribal status and cultural retention. There are those that ask why do American Indians need governments anymore? Aren't they just Americans like everybody else? Why can't they just celebrate their culture? Well, not only because of the difference between indigenous, indigenousness and non-indigenous people that I outlined, but also there are things that are not open to you unless you are part of a recognized tribe. Scholarships and Census Bureau acknowledgement, the possession of eagle feather, protection of tribal lands, being able to have your arts and crafts labeled as American Indian made, all are tied to tribal status. Sovereignty is something that is extremely important to our people. It's the right to govern ourselves and it's the right to identify who is and who is not a member of our tribe and what our own tribal heritage and history actually is to have a voice in representing us to the federal government and the other sovereigns around us, the state governments. Defending sovereignty is something that is extremely important and is constantly attacked by American Indies, Indian policy here in, in, the, uh, in the United States. According to Felix Cohen's federal Indian law, which is a standard, our tribes are inherently sovereign. They don't become sovereign because the United States claims to recognize them or a state government claims to recognize them. Sovereignty is inherent. You either have it or you don't. And recognition simply acknowledges that sovereignty for the purpose of dealing with that tribe, but it doesn't establish that sovereignty. Assaults on tribal sovereignty go back to the doctrine of discovery and the principle of manifest destiny, the miseducation and the colonized mindset. When you take a look at how American Indians are even defined in various laws, it's like a patchwork, a hydra's head of different ways of identifying based on what law you're talking about. And usually it's dividing our people and thinning us out. The images that you see are the erasure of our people and the claims of our land from 1492. To 1977. There are those who have heard of federal acknowledgement. That is where a tribe has become uh, listed for certain benefits and services by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And it, primarily up through the early 1900s was those tribes that had had some conflict with the United States, had been at war or had been pushed and moved and therefore had some treaty history or had been uh, in, enumerated in the enrollments because they were pushed onto reservations. But there were many tribes on either coast, the Atlantic and Pacific coast, that, that didn't happen to. They kind of stayed put, made no waves, had no war, and they were left off those lists. And so for many, they disappeared to history, even though records were still being kept and their identities were still known. But being left off that list meant you were not federally recognized. And even if, even when the United States in the late 70s established a process for recognition, it became so difficult between the 1970s and early 1990s that a recent study showed that 72% of currently federally recognized tribes could not successfully complete the federal recognition process as it is administered by the Bureau of American Indian Affairs. In fact, one of the recent tribes that got through the process, it took several decades and $50 million to be able to get through that process. And it took the decision of a court to force the Bureau to acknowledge them. It is an arduous thing that even many tribes that have never gone through that process do not understand. And it's another way that our people are divided between tribes that are recognized by the federal government, those that are recognized by state governments, and those that have no recognition by any of the governments that are not native. So linking tribal acknowledgement to, to uh, sovereignty and authenticity, that's damage to our people, causes anguish and pain, and, and it actually continues the process of destabilizing tribal governments. And it's it's very important that non-native people understand this continued struggle among, among the tribes and the struggle that the tribes have to maintain their heritage, their identity, their control over what is theirs. And the understanding that that's part of American heritage and should be honored and respected. 
one of the things that we face is the redefining of our people. The individuals you see in the photograph are relatives of mine from the uh, Manicoke Nation that were graduates of the Haskell Indian uh, um, School out in Kansas. They attended there from the 40s into the 70s or 80s, I believe. These graduates, uh, three of whom are cousins, they're Norwoods, um, <laughs> They're not able to have their own children go back to Haskell because the standard changed. There was a time where if you were had a certain percentage of Indian blood, at least were a half blood, you could go to those schools or you sometimes were forced to go. In the late 90s and early 2000s, that changed where you had to be a member of a federal, federally recognized tribe. Well, our tribes are state recognized. So their children can't even go to their alma mater. What is worse? is that many of the schools have erased their history. I was in a debate with a person who said that the only tribes that ever went to the boarding school there were federal. And I happened to have the photographs from the yearbooks that had my cousins in them. And I was able to show them that they were wrong. So this is, this is a real problem for our people. And whenever laws redefine who's eligible for what, usually they are slowly chipping away at American Indian identity. There is a document called the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples that, sh that the United States was one of the last nations to sign on to. And it should be something that every government official is aware of. It, it was signed in around 2010 to 2011 by um, uh, President Obama. And it should be guiding the government's interactions with, its, with the tribes. Sadly, the United States is not lived up to that, uh, but our tribes do honor it. and We even cite it in many of our resolutions. It's online. I encourage everyone to take a look at it. For more information, uh, I invite you to visit some of the websites that are here uh, that I list, and there are many others that you can get in information about our people and the continuing Native heritage here in our state and in our region. I thank you for your attention and and certainly want to give the floor back to our hosts. I pray that I was able to keep you awake and didn't put you to sleep. God bless you. Well, Dr. Norwood, I am wide awake. <laughs> <laughs> My ears are open. Um, I do want to, uh, before I, uh, I have a, a question, but before I ask my question, I do want to encourage our participants that if they do have any questions to please use the chat bubble to ask your questions. We have a very large group tonight and would be easy. The easiest thing for us is that if, if you would put the questions into the chat for me to pose them to Dr. Norwood to field. Um, I always feel like I, I learned something new. And I think because these are things that unfortunately are not covered when I went through my all my schooling. <laughs> I like to say, I think I'm an educated woman, um, but I always find new things. And um, as I said, I feel like my, my eyes are open and my ears are open. And one of the things that really struck me tonight that you were talking about the recognition aspect for the um, tribes and, you kept talking state recognized, state recognized. And are there currently nations that are going through that process right now that want to be recognized by the state? I mean, I'm sure federally that's happening as well, but I was specifically thinking yeah. about New Jersey. In New Jersey, it's interesting because um, the tribes in New Jersey were recognized uh, um, in the early 1980s. Uh, and they enjoyed that status without question until the early 2000s and then in the early 2000s because of the fear of casino gaming and indian gaming uh the gaming lobby in new jersey had a lot of control and suddenly new jersey got amnesia and our tribes had to fight to have new jersey reaffirm what they did and that fight raged from the early 2000s straight till 2018 uh in in 20 um, 12, we actually filed a lawsuit and it took six years to win, but we won. And the state acknowledged that what they had done. And, and uh, um, so, and so there are three tribes that were recognized, um, you know, 40 years ago or so, and are, are continuing, are, are still recognized uh, today. 
That's the Ramapo Lenape in the north, the Powhatan Lenape in the central part of the state, and the Nanticoke Lenape in the southern part of the state. Um, I, I know that the Sand Hill um, in, in, in uh, Monmouth County are very active on the Commission of New Jersey Affairs as they have a volunteer that, that represents their tribe, even though they're not on that commission by statute because you have to be state recognized. I believe that they are going to pursue that. I can't speak for them, but they are recognized by the tribes in New Jersey. You know, we've known them for generations. Thank you. And I do have many questions coming in. So we can we can go through a few of them and we'll see how everyone's feeling. <laughs> um, one of the first ones is I heard a reference to the Lene Lenape. I was under the impression that the correct term is Lenape, original people, because the term Lenny would be redundant, original, original people. Mm -hmm. Is this true? Um, it is true that it's redundant and it's redundant on purpose. There are many tribes that use in their own language uh, a word that essentially refers to the people. And the reason that the reduplication is used, and it's, it's absolutely appropriate just to say Lenape, absolutely appropriate. Matter of fact, if someone were to say, what, am, what are you? I'd say I'm Nanako Lenape. But the reason the reduplication is accurate and historic is because this ancient root uh, or tree trunk is what so many other tribes have branched off from. So the reduplication is an, a way of emphasizing, and it's an intentional reduplication, and it's historic. Thank you very much. And I, I do have people ask, well, there's many thank yous, many kudos, bravos, et cetera. Um, and I do want to let people know that this is video read. This is being recorded and it will be posted on our YouTube channel. And someone has asked for the resources that you included at the end of your slide um, and your presentation. And I will be sending out um, a an email after the event and I will list out the, the resources that Dr. Norwood had included as well as other resources that may be uh, help you in further research. Which leads me to the next question that came up is someone is asking um, if you can recommend a book and there might be more than one uh, to learn about the history of indigenous people in the centuries prior to the arrival of the Europeans. Mm. Um, well, that's very interesting. Yeah, that's there, a good one. <laughs> there is a book called, uh, Fort, I believe it's 1491, uh, written by a person whose last name is Mann, although I cannot recall the first name. Uh, 1491 is a book that actually talks about the Americas prior to the arrival of Columbus, based upon a lot of archaeological finds. And that same author has another follow-up book. And I apologize, but if, if you find the one, you'll find the other. Um, and uh, that does deal with the history of many of the tribal nations prior to the arrival of Europeans. Excellent. So I will look yeah. that up and I will include that in the, my post presentation email to everybody. No, every, I'll, I'm a librarian. I'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> and we have another and I, question. Just to add to it, you know, a couple of good books to, to check out. Um, one is actually a an autobiography, or it's a biography of our chief's mother, a delightful book, hard to put down once you pick it up. It's her telling her story, and it, um, it, it's called Strong Medicine Speaks, um, and it is uh, a, a, about Marion Strong Medicine Gould, who passed away a few years ago, and it was written by Amy Hill Hearth, outstanding book, really talks about what it was like growing up as a, as a tribal woman. Uh, within you know the past century, um, another book actually that's very good that depicts uh, accurately our tribal people from the perspective of a little European boy that wound up being embraced by the tribes. It's a fictional story, but it was written by an anthropologist, uh, anthropologist H. R. Harrington, and it's called Dickon Among the Indians. D I C K O N Among the Indians, also known as the Indians of New Jersey. It's fiction but it's accurate and it's a it's a good book for younger people i've actually read that one and i second great book <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, so I, I have another question. Um, in doing research on the African slave owned by the builder of my house, I came upon mulatto and free person of color and census records of the early 1800s. And I, you spoke to this a little bit. Might mm -hmm. these be indigenous people? I am in Mercer, Middlesex County, New Jersey. It's possible. Yeah. Um, you know, early on, the the uh, there were, was a lot of intermarriage. Many of the uh, of the indigenous people here on the East Coast uh, reflect that early intermarriage. I have African ancestry and an Atticoke Lenape ancestry, and um, it's, it is very possible. During the 1800s, actually in the in the 17 the 17 late 1700s into the early 1800s, you see this shift from identifying people as American Indian to identifying them as free persons of color um, or mulatto. And that wound up being misunderstood because of how that's viewed today. If you call somebody, someone a free person of color or a mulatto, the assumption is that they were that they were just of African descent, and that's not necessarily the case. They may have been mixed, or they they may have been Indian. I have ancestors that are uh, we've been able to trace were on reservations in Delaware, uh, were listed as Indian until they were converted to Christian. And, and upon their Christian baptism, they were called a free person of color. And then this other, th this one ancestor of mine was, then when they married a woman who, who was mixed black and Indian, they changed his race to mulatto in a subsequent census. Because at that time, it didn't matter what you said you were. It was what the census uh, re recorder assumed that you were. We have census records where the, where the, uh, in the in the 1900s, where our people identified themselves as Indian, and when the census record got back to the office, it, it's literally crossed out, and they were reclassified as black because, according to the state, there were no more Indians, and that that was in Delaware, but it, but it was not uncommon up and down the East Coast. Virginia, in particular, had a problem with that. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a thank you for the presentation. My question, how do indigenous people generally, generally feel about land acknowledgements that are done today before meetings, et cetera? I feel they're wonderful when they're properly done. <laughs> I, I, always, I always am um, uh, appreciative of every effort uh, and particularly excited when they're properly done and they don't refer to us only in past tense and they acknowledge the, the tribal communities that have continued in the area of that where that land acknowledgement is being given. Okay, here's a good question. How do you think the current Catholic schools that serve Indigenous children that used to take children from families by force, do they now play a positive role? You know, I, I have had a couple of presentations uh, hosted by a couple of the Roman Catholic schools, and um, I, I think, you know, I can't speak for all Roman Catholic schools that may have had that history, but I, I, based upon the leadership of any individual school, there seems to be an acknowledgement that, that uh, certain corrections need to be made, uh, efforts need to be made. Um, certainly that's not universal because I've heard things on the opposite end of the spectrum. Uh, and that's not only with Roman Catholic schools. There are, there are, there were boarding schools among many of the Christian denominations that the federal government actually worked with many of the denominations. And, and quite a few of the, what we call mainline denominations have made statements um, uh, that are statements of repentance over participating in the doctrine of discovery and the boarding school history. Um, sadly, the Roman Catholic Church is not one of them. I was part of a delegation that was hoping that when uh, the Pope visited in Philadelphia, that he would make a statement about that and would would um, uh, turn the clock backwards, I guess, to you know just repudiate the doctrine of discovery. But uh, unfortunately, we didn't get very far.
Can you take a couple more? You doing okay? Oh yeah. I'm, okay. I'm, go ahead, fire away. <laughs> Do you know the name of the tribe that was in the area of Jersey City when the early Dutch settlers arrived in Manhattan? I heard that the Dutch massacred that tribe in the middle of the night for no reason, including including women and children. So that's Jersey yeah. City area. Yeah. Um, I, I'm aware that there were quite a few battles in yeah. what we refer to as wars that are not taught here in uh, in the New Jersey schools, sadly. I am uncertain. I, I, I don't know the specific name of that one off the top of my head. Um, there were conflicts with the Dutch. Uh, we both traded with and fought the Dutch, especially in Delaware. Funny thing is that the the chief of uh, our sister tribe in Delaware still takes great pride in the fact that his ancestors burned down the uh, fort at Swanendale in, uh, in Cape and Lopen back in the 1600s. But um, I'm unaware of the actual name of, of, of that community. Many of the um, tribes had names that were local to their region, usually you know, associated with the name of a river or some land feature. And then on top of that, there were regional names. And then on top of that, there's the, the, the national name of Lenape. And so the individual uh, community, I, 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 I don't know. I, I am, I, I, I know of that history, but I can't recall it off the top of my head. And I apologize for that. The history of coloniza colonism, colonization. I'm sorry, I'm just go back, but but the larger group they would have been a part of is Muncie. The specific, Muncie. Yeah, yes. the specific tribe. Uh, the Muncie were the northernmost division of Lenape Hoking, of the Lenape people, uh, and so they, they would have been a Muncie in the Muncie tribal area. But the specific community you're referring to, I can I cannot recall. Okay. The history of colonization is littered in the conscious elimination of native peoples. It is difficult to accept that the underpinnings for taking land and the lives of people in this country vest with Christianity. So that's more of a comment than, than a question. Well, you know, and, and it, it, is, it is sad. And certainly um, what I would say is that uh, it was done by people who claimed to be Christian, but certainly it was not done by Christianity. Uh, there is a distinction. Frederick Douglass had a wonderful statement where he said that he didn't understand and he absolutely hated the Christianity of this land, but he loved the Christianity of Christ. And he distinguished between the true faith and the way people practiced it. And, uh, you know, that's something that I think people need to bear in mind. I'm a Christian and Christianity was one of the reasons that, that my ancestors were able to stay on this land and gather in churches and maintain their culture. Um, and, uh, and, and so there, there are atrocities that have been committed by people who claim to be Christian in the name of Christ that have nothing to do with Christianity. And so I try to make that distinction. No, and I thank you for bringing, doing the, or commenting on the Frederick Douglass quote, because that is, I think that's very poignant these days to remember. Um, and then the next question by is- By the way, there... Frederick Douglass, Frederick Douglass was part Indian. A lot of people don't know that. That he had, yes, his, uh, I, I believe it was his mother was, uh, was half tribal. So he was one quarter. I learned something else new. <laughs> are there any projects in New Jersey where indigenous people are working with environmentalists to heal lands damaged by destructive farming practices, et cetera? I know that the, that the tribes have been, uh, been working to protect the land from some of the pipelines that, have, that you know, the push to, to, uh, for pipelines. I know that especially the Ramapo Lenape in the north have been fighting over issues of their mountain having been poisoned. There's a movie uh, that was done by that, I believe it was by HBO called Man versus Ford. And um, it was about the poisoning of that land and how uh, um, rates of cancer are so prevalent among that community. Um, there are extreme environmentalists in each of the tribes, um, the, but that does not necessarily mean that all of the tribes are focused on environmentalism in and of itself. Tribal tradition is in relationship with the land and maintaining that relationship and protecting the land. Some of the, the 
politics around environmentalism, you know, individual natives may become very active in, but I'll be honest with you, tribes are so focused on just staying alive and staying together um, that, uh, uh, you know, individuals are far more, more active than tribal governments are. It's certainly an aspect, but it's not the major focus, unfortunately. And you refer to a church that is still active, Lenny Lenape Church. Um, what is the name and where is it located? The one in New Jersey is the St. John's Church, United Methodist Church in uh, Fordville, which is a small community in Bridgeton. Um, and matter of fact, until the springtime, their pastor actually was Nanakoke. He sadly passed away uh, in July. But that church is, is a historic church. And there are two in Delaware. In Sussex County, it is the uh, Indian Mission Church, which is a Banacoke church. And uh, in um, Kent County, it is the mm, Emmanuel, Emmanuel Church in uh, Cheswold. I actually really love this next question. <laughs> <laughs> It's talking about your shirt that you're wearing and oh. if the symbols mean anything and if they do. <laughs> yeah, uh, this, you know, uh, this shirt um, was made by a friend of the tribe and the symbols do have significance. The, the, the turtle obviously is the symbol of Lenape people and also represents Turtle Island. There are many, many tribes that use that as a prominent symbol. Um, the medicine wheel, which is not traditional for our people, but has been adopted by our people, uh, represents the four directions and healing. Um, I like the, the, the central um, the cross in the medicine wheel, even though it's pointing to the four directions. For me, it also represents the cross of Christ because I am a Christian. Uh, the, the, the power that both emanates and comes from that in, 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 in prayer is symbolized. So the, each of the symbols means a little something, uh, both to the original artist, and to myself. I love it. Thank you so much. Um, and then this is actually someone's asking about sources for essential, oh, essential traditional stories for children or adults that you would recommend. Um, well, one is uh, the the Lenape, the the Indians of New Jersey, Dickin Among the Indians by Harrington. For little children, there are a couple of interesting books uh, that uh, uh, are, are are recent. One was. Um, the Kate, I believe it's called the Kate May Diamond. It's a children's book, and it actually, uh, the illustrations feature some of our tribal members. Um, another is called, I believe, Little Bear Makes a Wigwam. Uh, but if you go to the Nanakoke uh, Lenape Museum site, which is one of the sites listed, um, there is a list of resources of recommended books and also a discussion about what is traditional and what is not. Uh, these, a lot of people sadly have been taken in by modern stories and there's nothing wrong with the modern story, but it is wrong to say it's traditional if it's not. Um, and so there's a discussion on at the nanakoklenapemuseum.org site if you visit there. And then the next one is a comment. Um, I read the journals of Lewis and Clark and there's no way they would have survived without help from so many Indian tribes. <laughs> Amen to that. <laughs> they, would have been, they would have been the two guys missing. <laughs> Thank you for that comment, Zach. Um, just a couple more, okay. Uh, thank you so much for sharing with us. Last year, I was listening to a podcast about tribal sovereignty called This Land, which detailed, detailed a case from the Cherokee Nation that went before the Supreme Court. I was wondering, have there, have there been any repercussions from the results of this case for the Lenape? Yeah, well, the, whenever the Supreme Court makes a decision over one tribe, or actually over any principle, it affects that for everyone in the country. And certainly that's the same when the Supreme Court has rulings um, in dealing with, with uh, tribal policy. Uh, the, what we call the Marshall Trilogy of, of decisions that occurred in the under Chief Justice Marshall in the early 1800s diminished the tribe's ability to exercise its own sovereignty, to determine that we were going to be called domestic sovereign nations with a diminished sovereignty. Um, which furthered the ability of the United States to 
move us around and to claim our land. Um, it also um, uh, uh, diminished our, our, our ability to deal with other sovereigns and we were completely placed under the jurisdiction of the United States Congress. Now, just because that decision was made doesn't mean we pay attention to it. Uh, our tribe is actually in a treaty relationship with other nations right now under the uh, United League of Indigenous Nations, which stretches out and we are in treaty relationships with tribes, that, uh, with, with Indigenous people as far out as Australia, New Zealand, um, and, and so, that's something that is stated. It is difficult for us to exercise our sovereignty because of these things that are placed on us. But like I said before, if you're sovereign, it's not because somebody gave it to you. So we are in treaty relationship now with other nations. Many years ago, um, this participant took a group of students to Waterloo Village in Northern New Jersey. The village included a Lenape component. Is this still there? I believe so. Um, I, interestingly enough, I've never visited it, although I've heard about it. I've heard that the that the depictions of the village are, are accurate, um, but I can't speak too much about it beyond that. I've heard, I've heard the depictions of the village are fairly accurate. And are you familiar with the story of Penelope Stout, a European woman who lived among the Lenape Indians in 1639? Do you know where that took place? It was, I believe it was in, it's north of here. I don't, it's not Mercer County. It's north of, I believe it's yeah. north of here. I've, I've heard the name. I, I, I'm unfamiliar with the details of the story. Uh, there have been quite a few stories of people who have lived among us and those who were cared for by us. In fact, uh, one of the families, I met, I met a gentleman years ago who was at a, a retirement center. And after I made a presentation, he came up with tears in his eyes and he thanked me. And I thought he was thanking me for the presentation. He thanked me for saving his life. And he wasn't referring to me personally, he was referring to my people. Because when his um, ancestors came to this land, they were destitute and dying. And uh, the local Lenape community took them in and fed them and enabled them to survive. So his entire family would have died from that early, early colonial period, if it had not been for the interaction with our tribe. And he actually named our tribe in his will, um, thanking us and established a scholarship fund, a book scholarship fund for our children. So uh, th that interaction is, is very common. And many of the people who were taken uh, as what, you know, today would be called hostages, actually they were, they were replacing family members who were lost and there are so many instances of women, especially, who were taken by uh, Lenape tribes who um, did not want to be uh, rescued because they had more rights as, as, a, as a Lenape woman, uh, considered a woman among the tribe, than they did in the colonies because our, the women in our tribe have always uh, enjoyed equality. Matter of fact, uh, sometimes it's superiority. <laughs> She did clarify that she believes it's Monmouth County, which I think is correct. We had a whole presentation on Penelope Stout also earlier this year. <laughs> I'd be very interested in, in, uh, in seeing that. Um, we're just going to do a couple more, okay? So it's uh, you refer to Kite's War, aka Wappinger War, 1643 to 1645. The Pavonia Massacre was part of this war. Okay. okay. Um, Wappinger, yeah. Wappinger, it, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was more, I think that was someone following up from something earlier. That, and yes, then, that um, sounds familiar, yes. Mm -hmm. I think your mic is off. Thank you. What okay. position does your tribe take on reparations? Um, well, reparations comes in many different forms. And yeah. uh, having access to certain things, uh, one of the ways that that uh, reparations has taken can take place is that there are special programs for American Indian businesses and doing business with the federal government. Um, I, I don't know of tribal leaders that are simply looking for handouts. They just want access and the understanding that tribal governments care for uh, tribal people usually at a much better price per item 
than state governments do because we don't have the bureaucracy. And so um, having access to be able to run our businesses, to have certain privileges, to, to uh, access to funds for healthcare and things like that are, are aspects of, that re of, of reparations. Uh, simply handing out the check, you know, it, it, being fair in the budget and honoring treaties is usually what, what is stated at the national level among, among uh, Indian leaders. Honor the treaties, um, include us in the budget as you promised you would, and understand that we serve American citizens who are citizens of our tribes, that it's not something extra. Oftentimes, the only services that they will get is from, is from the tribes. Thank you very much. So this will be our final question for the evening. I want to thank everybody for staying with us for the long haul. <laughs> and it's, um, I'm going to, I'm not going to be able to say this word. I understand Shabakunk is a Lenape word. Is that correct? S-H-A-B-A-K-U-N-K. Do you know what it means? The unk is a is a, an affix at the end of a word that usually is, is indicates a place, um, and so that much I I would be aware of. Sadly, a lot of the place names in New Jersey um, are based on Lenape words, but it's based on how a European heard it pronounced, and often it's written in a way that it's hard to understand exactly what the original real word was. Uh, quite a few place names fall into that. Um, so unfortunately, I, I, I would have to kind of study the word and, and go to a real linguist. I'm a student of the language, but I am not an expert. And uh, so many of the words, even among those who uh, were born to Nape speakers that preserved the language out in Oklahoma, uh, one of whom was Nora, Nora uh, Thompson Dean, she said that many of the place names here were based on archaic forms of the language that were misheard by Europeans. And she even had a hard time figuring out what some of the words originally were. Some of, I'm sorry, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but if somebody wants to send a word in for me to see if I can figure it out, I'd be happy to try on my own and then go to somebody who knows much more about the language than I do. Thank you so much. We have someone talking about the Shabakunk Creek, um, that that was part of a tributary that flows into the Delaware River. So it's associated with there somehow mm -hmm. but i do want to thank you there are just a gazillion thank yous in the um in the in the chat um just for your knowledge for your research for your representation all of it just uh the whole thing <laughs> so well, i'm honored you. to be able to uh, to share i i thank everyone we say wanishi which means thank you and uh we don't have a word for goodbye uh, but we do say i will see you again and that's la peach kanewa Thank you so much. And everyone, thank you again for attending tonight. Amelia, thank you for your work behind the scenes. And I do want to thank the Friends of the Hopewell Branch, the Friends of the West Windsor Library, the Heightstown Library Association, and the Friends of the Lawrence Library, who gratefully made this um, program possible. Thank you so much, everyone, and stay safe and have a good night. Thank you so much. <laughs> This conference will now be recorded. This conference will now be recorded. <laughs>